Hello and welcome to Money Control. I'm at the India Energy Week and while there are a lot of players from the fossil fuel industry here, I managed to catch hold of a champion of green energy, Suman Sana, founder and chairman Renew Power. Welcome to Money Control, Mrs. Sana. Thank you. Pleasure to be here with you, Rajita, as always. Mr. Sinha, yes, um, uh, at the India Energy Week inaugural ceremony, the Prime Minister was talking about the demand growth in energy in India. Of course, he was also quoting the IA report, which says that India's energy growth would be the highest in the world going ahead. We have done a lot of things in uh, different segments of energy, uh, whether it's hydrocarbons or clean energy. From where we stand right now, what are the gaps that still need to be plugged? You know, there are some fundamental issues in India. Uh, as you know, India is uh, the biggest, probably the biggest fossil fuel importer. Our energy bill is about $150 billion or more of ex imports every year. We in the, even import things like coal and so on. So I would say that uh, the whole energy sector in India needs a lot of work, uh, which the government is, uh, is certainly targeting to do uh, in terms of decreasing our imports. Um, and increasing our energy security. Uh, so I would say that this is a lot of work to be done. Uh, renewables is just one aspect of it, but I think uh, downstream things beyond renewables like green hydrogen, for example, hopefully allow us to decrease this dependence on imports. Uh, I think it will take many decades for us to work on that. And the Prime Minister, of course, has set a target of 2047 to become energy independent. Um, this is going to require trillions of dollars of investments. Um, and so to your question about gaps, I think the whole area is really a huge work in progress right now. It is a moving target of sorts because we are talking about uh, being energy sufficient and yet we are really nowhere close to it right now. Of course, the global markets continue to be very, very volatile. But going ahead, do you think that at least the global queues would settle down this year? What is your take on it? Because uh, a lot of people we have spoken to at in, uh, India Energy Week seem to think that 2023 would be exceptionally volatile as well. And it will be tough for energy importing countries like India. Well, you know, my sense is that the energy transition is not going to be a smooth one. It is going to be bumpy. Uh, oil prices already were very volatile earlier, given just demand supply uh, issues. Uh, now add to that the whole issue of potential demand changes on account of renewable energy as well coming in. That's just going to increase the, the, uh, the volatility of, of oil prices. And then, of course, the geopolitical situation globally, growth in China, all of those are things that are going to cause a lot of uncertainty. And oil prices are extremely elastic, so you will see a lot of up and down movement of oil prices. And that is going to put pressure on a country like India, which is a big uh, oil importer. Look, I think the long-term solution is as quickly as possible, we should wean ourselves off oil, right? But it's not an easy task. It's a mammoth task. Uh, today, economies are based almost entirely on fossil fuels. The whole mobility sector is based on fossil fuels. A large part of the power generation is based on fossil fuels. So we need to do a tremendous amount of work on the user industry side um, and, of course, on the generation side as well. So there is, I, I, look, this is a multi-decadal task. It's not going to happen overnight. Uh, but uh, India, until at least we are able to decrease that, that dependence, is always going to be subject to uh, price volatility. And that's always going to be a bit of an Achilles heel for the Indian economy. Achilles heels uh, sound uh, alarming enough, but uh, there are enough things happening which give hope. So uh, one of the most interesting things, of course, is the green hydrogen and the push on that. The government has already announced a policy. The nitty gritties are being worked out. What is your sense uh, by when will we have more clarity on it? I'm sure you're interacting with the government on this as well. And uh, are there gaps in that that need to be filled as well? Look, I think, uh, the look, first of all, it's great that the government has uh, taken, uh, you know, it's putting, it's pushing the whole hydrogen, uh, the green hydrogen piece so significantly. It's great that they've announced a national green hydrogen policy and they've actually allocated money behind that. Uh, obviously, the, the clarity of how that money is going to be allocated, will there be mandates on users of grey hydrogen to shift to green hydrogen within India to create a domestic market, uh, all of those are things that still need to be worked out. Uh, state level policies for green hydrogen also need to be worked out and I would really encourage all the states very seriously to look at all of their plans for um, you know how they want to encourage themselves green hydrogen. I think that's also going to be very important. Now having said that I think uh, that uh, the world is you know making a lot of uh, sort of uh, 
incentives behind or putting a lot of incentives behind green hydrogen and the renewable industry in general in their respective countries. The US has announced the IRA, Europe is announcing a new green uh, deal as well. Um, and so the export market is going to be a little bit challenging. And I think uh, that's something that the government has to put a little bit of its thinking cap on to figure out how will that really work out. Because ultimately, uh, we're competing not just with the US and Europe, uh, of course, for both the domestic markets as well as for the, for the export markets. We're also competing with countries uh, in other parts of the world, you know, which have abundant land, good sunshine and so on yeah. as well. So I think that's an era that does require a bit of thinking uh, still. That's a very relevant point because it's not just a competition within states. I mean, it is a global race to become a big supplier of uh, green hydrogen. Looking at the global environment, uh, what are we doing uh, right right now that can help the green hydrogen story? Look, I think, as I said, the government so far has been very proactive about announcing the National Green Hydrogen Mission in giving incentives to allow the movement of power to the electrolyzers, which can therefore be at the port. Um, they are uh, certainly, you know, trying to come out of the details around the national green hydrogen policy. So all of those are really positive. As I said, for the domestic market, they still need to announce the domestic uh, mandates and so on. But I think all of that will also happen, right? The issue really is the export market, where we really have to compete with other parts of the world. And that is a moving target. Um, because as I said, other countries are changing their own policies quite substantially and the incentives and the subsidies that they're giving. So I think India is going to have to re respond to that as well in some way. Of course, we as companies out of India will be looking at developing projects in India and, uh, and essentially finding export markets. And in some cases, India will certainly have an advantage because of our geographic location and our, 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 our linkages, trade linkages and so on. But I think if you really want to achieve the target of 5 million tons, out of which a large part has to come from the export market, I think that could be a little bit challenging. Mr. Sinha, you have a very interesting strategy on green hydrogen. You have tied up with uh, engineering major Larson and Tubro, IOCL in India. And you have also signed up with the Egypt government to set up a plant there. I mean, it's an $8 billion plant. So what is the overall strategy? How are you looking at developing uh, green hydrogen under Renew? Well, you know, uh, you're absolutely right. In India, we have announced a joint venture with LNT and IOCL. Uh, all of us bring complementary skill sets uh, to developing the green hydrogen ecosystem uh, in India. And we certainly want to be, uh, uh, want our joint venture to be the preeminent green hydrogen player in the country. Uh, and I think that will happen just simply because of our commitment and, and our skill sets and so on. Uh, as far as the international market is concerned, uh, as I said earlier, it certainly could be the case that other geographies are better to export to, let's say, markets like Europe and so on. And so as a company, you just have to be prudent and look at some of those opportunities as well to make sure that if, if they end up being competitive, then you have, a, you have a leg in there as well. Now, Egypt is not the only market we're looking at, of course. We're looking at other markets as well. And uh, so we'll see. We'll see what happens. I think Egypt was first off the block. Uh, we're still about 12 to 18 months away from a firm investment decision. Right now, we're still doing a lot of feasibility studies and so on. Uh, and so that will take some time to play itself out. And, uh, but I think, look, the reality is uh, green hydrogen eventually is going to be a globally trade, tradable commodity. And I think, therefore, you have to go to geographies where you feel that, you know, you can get a competitive uh, uh, cost of production. Mr. Sinha, when uh, my final question is on Renew again, I mean, when you started the company, mm -hmm. uh, I remember having a conversation with you and uh, how upbeat you were on solar and wind. I mean, uh, the story has changed significantly and you have had a first mover's advantage in green uh, hydrogen and hopefully it will come through going ahead as well. The way the company is evolving, what would be, what would, give me some color on where you see Renew in the next five years. You know, uh, Rachita, it's very interesting. We've had a pretty, a pretty phenomenal journey over the last 12 years. And, and look, nobody could have forecast how the whole market is going to evolve. I think the important thing for us is to keep executing well, uh, keep making sure that our core business, which is the Indian renewable energy business, grows well. So that is really going to be our first effort. But I think beyond that, what we are finding is that now the whole, the whole conversation is changing. Uh, corporates are becoming very, I think, keen on really moving forward on their own net zero journeys. And so therefore, there's an opportunity for companies like ours to really broad base our product footprint a little bit and maybe our geographic footprint and our customer footprint also. So really just from targeting utilities in India as, as potential buyers from us, we're also now targeting corporates, for example. 
corporates have different requirements. They have requirements around hydrogen and derivatives of hydrogen. They have requirements around some other decarbonization products. So those are things that we're looking at and we're trying to see how can we position ourselves really as a decarbonization player in this whole evolving climate change space as we go forward. Best of luck for that and thank you so much for talking to Money Control. We'll always, uh, we always cherish your perspective. Thank you. Thank you so much.